you think Gandhi also acted as a catalyst in uniting Indians, in making them secular, in making them uh, aware of their identity first as Indians and then later as their regional identities? Do you think he was responsible and how, like your comments on that? Yes, I think, um, you know, a major contribution of Gandhi is uh, in bringing people belonging to different strata of society into a common endeavor. And that common endeavor was not only in terms of opposing the British, but in creating a sense of self-respect as Indians and uh, through that establishing an identity of their own. And it is as a result of that you find, number one, Gandhi tried to understand India himself. We have uh, uh, Gandhi's efforts during the early phase to be aware of the problems of the country. And then slowly and slowly relating those problems with the programs that he undertook. And that is where we find him getting involved with the problem of the workers, problem of the peasants, problem of women, problem of untouchables. In fact, all marginalized sections or oppressed sections of society. One may have differences of opinion about, as many historians have, about the methods that he used in all these cases. But there is no denying the fact that he was so conscious about these marginalized sections in society and tried his best to bring them into the mainstream uh, opposition to colonial rule and thus uh, to nationalism. That is to say, what I am trying to say is that it is not really making people part of an agitation but is going beyond that and trying to impart to people an awareness of their, their rights. And that is where, in fact, some sort of an identity between people and nation really takes place. And Gandhian perspective, Gandhian effort was really to establish this identity between the nation and the people. regarding the <clears throat> actions taken by Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bose vis-a-vis -vis, like Gandhi on one hand and Netaji on one hand, one going in for military thing while the other was doing it in a peaceful manner. But do you think that uh, Netaji and the INA hastened the process of gaining freedom? Like uh, what importance would you give to the INA and its efforts in finally getting our freedom in 1947 and not later? Hmm. I think let us uh, not forget the fact that uh, there is a very important uh, stream within the Indian national movement which believed in the use of force. Uh, the Gandhian nonviolence, which we always attribute to Indian national movement is not something which was universally accepted in India. From the early 20th century, starting in fact by the end of the 19th century in Maharashtra, there was a strong movement which believed that if you really want to remove the British from India, the only way is violence. And as a result of that, you have the tradition of the revolutionary nationalists in India. And therefore, uh, by the time Netaji undertakes a more militant path in the national movement, there is a section within Indian society who believed in the efficacy um, uh, of such tactics, or let, let me not say efficacy, the importance of, of such uh, tactics. 
And it is in that context that one should see uh, Netaji's efforts. INA undoubtedly played a very major role in the national movement. It played an important role by um, stimulating the, uh, the strong sentiments of opposition in people. Number two, by creating a sense of idealism in the youth. And thirdly, also by pointing to the colonial rulers that if they do not live up to the promises they, they did, as they did in 1918, well, for Indians, there is a different path. And that path is one not only within India, but it internationally. As it happened at that time, one may have differences of opinion about the instruments that he used. Nedaji, for instance, used the used and accepted the support of fascist um, forces in the world. One may disagree with that, but the, the basic idea that the, the colonial rule has to be fought and if necessary fought, fought with armed um, uh, support is, is a very, very important lesson both to Indians as well as to the colonial rulers. But did his actions actually hasten the process in your views? But, uh... Uh, you see, it is very difficult to make a judgment on that. Despite the hindsight that we have, whether it is hastened or not. But one should accept the fact that after 42, uh, after the Quit India struggle, uh, there is there are several um, pressures built uh, within India and outside, uh, which in a way hasten the process. I would think I would think that INA was one of them in hastening the process of the Indian independence. I would not see it only an isolated instance, but several pressures. You know, the uh, the naval mutiny, the the resentment among the, the peasants, the, among the workers, etc. There is militancy emerging. There is radicalism emerging in Indian society at that time, which undoubtedly hasn't, which made the colonial rulers rethink about the possibility of their staying longer in India. From that point of view, INA is, yes, undoubtedly. I might break up <coughs> into several parts instead of just two as the British plan. Do you think uh, there was really a fear for uh, the balkanization of uh, India at that time with the princely states becoming separate independent identities? Yes, at the time of uh, partition and immediately after the partition, immediately after independence, uh, such a, uh, a possibility and a danger really existed in India. Uh, in fact, there are uh, many scholars in the 50s who believe that India will not last long. A balkanization will take place. Um, but it did not take place uh, because of uh, two reasons. One, uh, the course of the national movement provided for a complementary development between the uh, pan-Indian nationalism and nationality consciousness. They did not develop in contradictory terms and antagonistic terms, but in mutual complementary terms. And as a result of that, the idea of uh, mutuality uh, was pretty strong in India even at that time. The second the possibility existed uh, as a result of the large number of Indian states who technically became independent with the lapse of British paramountcy in 1947. But then only those who would have managed to become independent who had a following from the people. If you look at the history of the national movement, 
in all Indian states, the people struggled against the Indian rulers for democratic rule. And therefore, their destiny, their future was not with the Indian feudal rulers, but with the newly emerging democratic order. And therefore, such a division, such a balkanization was not possible. So on both these counts, that is the consciousness of the people, the relationship between nationalities and nation, and the democratic processes within Indian states, such a possibility was ruled out. And that is why India remained as a nation after that. makes a secularism such an important tenet for the survival of uh, Indian democracy? Because there cannot be democracy without secularism. Because democracy uh, is basically a doctrine of equality. And a doctrine of equality in all spheres, political, social, and economic. So if you want a political equality, uh, unless you have equality of all citizens before the state, and the state considers all as equal, without any reference to religious belonging, you know, a democracy really cannot function, and it is not real democracy, even if you give it the name of democracy. So secularism and democracy cannot be um, uh, differentiated it cannot really be made separate at all. So for the survival of a democratic order in India, secularism is the key, is the basic uh, prerequisite, and therefore uh, the importance of secularism in India. Uh, today, secularism is under great strain, under great tension. It's under siege. Now, one of the reasons as to why it is so is because Indian society, Indian ruling classes, to a large extent Indian intelligentsia, has looked upon secularism only as a political phenomenon. And as a result of that, they have uh, tried to uh, locate secularism in terms of the relationship between state and society, as far as its political manifestation is concerned. Uh, but if secularism is to succeed, it has got to be a social phenomenon. The society has got to be secular. The civil society, in civil society, secularism should be a dominant hegemonic idea. It has not been so in India. Yes, um, so yes, uh, so I was saying that secularism uh, in a society like ours has got to be a social phenomenon and not purely a political phenomenon. Um, the state will never be secular unless the society is secular and not the other way around. Just because the society, the state is secular, the society need not necessarily be secular. I think that is really the situation that we are facing in our country. Secondly, there is also an undue emphasis on religious harmony. We can take the example of Gandhi. Gandhi spent his entire time, entire life, and sacrificed it for the sake of Hindu-Muslim unity, something which he was not able to achieve at all. This is because he was trying to establish unity in a society in which secularism was not a dominant uh, consciousness. Not that Indian society is not secular, but uh, Hindu-Muslim unity can only be an expression of secularism and not that secularism becomes an outcome of Hindu-Muslim unity. 
So it is, I think, it is that dilemma that actually Indian society is facing. So in India, secularism would succeed, secularism would become a dominant force, and the challenges it is facing today would be overcome when in the society, the social consciousness becomes secular. Can we uh, term this as a sort of pseudo-secularism that is prevalent uh, today? No, there isn't anything like uh, pseudo-secularism and secularism. There is only secularism and communalism. Those who are talking about pseudo-secularism are communalists who would not like to uh, accept secularism as the major important central tenant of India. Uh, the distinction is not because pseudo and secular, but between communal and secular. And you can define what secularism is. Yeah, um, no, I was saying that it is uh, also based on one's own conception of secularism. Uh, those who are talking about secularism uh, as pseudo secularism tend to argue that secularism is nothing but tolerance. And tolerance of whom? Tolerance of the majority community of India. Tolerance itself is a bad word to my mind because you, know, you are tolerating something because you have no other way. So secularism is not tolerance at all. Secularism is something entirely different from that in which if one can put it uh, very simply, it is a divorce of religion in public and institutional practices. If that is pseudo-secularism, then I think you know, one has to debate in this country what is secularism.